Welcome back to page 121, and more importantly, welcome to the Fifth Frontier War. I took a brief look at this last week when it came out, and I've had an opportunity to read through it, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take a look at the whole thing. Uh, overall, I really like the book. I have a few grumbles. I'll, I'll save those as they come up throughout the uh, video. So we start out the Fifth Frontier War by Martin Doherty, always well written. Martin's an excellent writer. We get the table of contents. The introduction telling us what the Fifth Frontier War is, which is basically a war between, for all purposes, between the Third Imperium and the Zidani Consulate. The uh, Zidani have the Outworld Coalition, uh, which the Swordworlds are part of, and some Vargir groups. There, They form the Outworld Coalition along with some other minor groups. And the Third Imperium has, of course, for their, their allies, the Darians. This is all in the Spinward Marches. Uh, the historical perspective is very nice. We get a nice look at the early frontier wars, wars one through four, one of which led to the first rebellion in the Imperium and the ouster of the then emperor and the installation of the current ruling family. And we go on to the fourth frontier war and then strategic realities, how you fight a war in space. The truth is you can always just move away from your opponent and travel. You simply jump to a different system. But your opponent, if he has a planet or some kind of station he has to guard, is pinned down by that thing and you can attack him there. So it's some fun of, of the strategic realities of interstellar war. You can't be strong everywhere. You have to pick where you're going to be strong. <clears throat> Overview of the conflict. Why is there a war being fought? Well, there's been tensions between the Imperium and the Zodani for a long time. The Zodani feel the Imperium is pushing too hard in their territory. The Imperium feels that the Zodani are scary, mind-mastering uh, boogeymen, and uh, the two just don't get along. Really, the Zodani probably are playing the longer game, where they're trying to establish a more stable border with a possibly slightly weakened Third Imperium. But uh, that's there's an argument that that's what all these uh, frontier wars have been about, is the Zodani just going for some greater meta thing rather than just uh, the end of the actual war itself. So we get the overview of the conflict. We get some great artwork, great artwork throughout this book. I really enjoy it. We're going to look at all of the belligerent powers, starting with the Third Imperium. This section is obviously going to be the largest because that's the one we're most familiar with. We get a look at the Imperial Navy, the Spinward Marches Sector Fleet. We get a lot of looks at Sector Fleets. Here we get the entire Imperial Naval Order of Battle. That's all the way from the fleets that are existent in the Spinward Marches to the Corridor Fleet, which is the street strategic reserve. I really enjoyed that. We get a lot of look at the order of battle. And then we go by theater. The Jewel Regina Theater, Erlana or Aramis Theater, and so on. All pretty neat. What the Imperium has. Now, the Fifth Frontier War has been started by the Zodani. They took a sucker punch at the Third Imperium and breached the Treaty of the Fourth Imperium and attacked by surprise. So the Third Imperium was already on its back foot, dealing with the fact that they were surprised. They were not completely surprised. They knew some hostility was possible. They just didn't anticipate it when it happened and exactly where. So we get a look at some additional forces they can bring to bear. This can be as low as your players in their little 200-ton merchant ship. Imperial ground forces. Just nice look at the Imperial as it as a whole, I really enjoyed it. Imperium, rather, in the third in the Spinward Marches. And then belligerent powers, the Zodani Consulate. We get a nice look at the Zodani Consulate, their force composition, their warships. Really nice. No uh, high guard of any kind in this book, which is one of my minor grumbles. I wanted to see a ship or two, uh, but didn't get any. Uh, the Zodani Navy, or, Order of Battle. We get a nice look at all of their fleets and where they're moving. Victory Force Jewel. That's the Zidani Force tasked with taking Jewel. And Victory Force E Fate. And so on straight through. I'm just going to go past this part. But this, this is really nice. This is a good chunk of the book. We're 61 pages in on my 
little reader here, and we're still going through just the force compositions themselves. Love that picture. And then we get the Zidani ground forces. Lots and lots of stuff in the Zidani ground forces. Again, gorgeous artwork. Then we get a look at the Darien Confederation. Darians are a minor human race that have uh, adapted very nicely to where they where their home world is and where they exist. At one point in their history, they accidentally made their son go nova uh, during, during an experiment. They have since had a device called the Star Trigger, which I'll take a look at in one of the uh, future videos because I love the Star Trigger. Um, but the Darians also boast tech level 16 on a lot of their vessels, so they're quite advanced. So we get a look at all their forces, and then we go to, as soon as my tablet catches up, there you go, nice map layout, the Darien Ground Forces, Belligerent Powers, the Sword Worlds Confederation, basically space barbarians, if you will, Vikings, I love the Sword Worlds, I always thought they were kind of neat, they used to be played as just the titular bad guys that were always just out there being hairy thugs that were going to cause problems for the Imperium. They've matured, the they being the writers, have matured the viewpoint of the Sword Worlders and to make them an actual confederation that could do something. As it is, they are deeply fractured internally. You have to have someone's permission to use the ships in battle so you can find yourself suddenly deprived of a lot, quite a few of your ships for your planned operation. It makes for a very interesting and fluid opponent to deal with, but ultimately they weaken themselves by the, all the infighting. And we get a look at the Sword World Ground Forces. Some more excellent artwork. And then factions and minor powers. We get factions within the Imperium. There are people that want to fight the war, but they want to do it for their own reasons. And we got other people who don't want to fight the war at all and think there should be peace. And we even have a little bit of pro-Zodani, which is kind of neat. Mora Foremost is one of the uh, political viewpoints held by one of the Sector Dukes, Duchess. Sector Duke Norris, very famous for the Fifth, Imper uh, Fifth Frontier War. Imperial Hawks, those are the people that want the war. Imperial Doves, people that think there should be peace. And Einigavar, or Einigavar, I-N-E, new word, G-I-V-A-R, however you want to say it. I've always said Einigavar, I don't know why. I think that's just how I heard it in my head. These are neat. This is a terrorist group within the Imperium that used to just kind of be written off as a uh, Zodani sleeper force that came up. But we get a little more life to the Einigavar in uh, this section. We find out that at one time there were legitimate movement and uh, came, came, became kind of subverted by Zodani agents. I am going to take a deeper look at some of these factions in future videos. The Einigavar are just so much fun. Factions within the Zodani Consulate. We all see the Zodani Consulate is this one big monolithic thought pattern because they use psionics and they make their people conform and they're evil in that way, etc., etc. But really, there are factions within the Zodani Consulate. I like that the Zodani are not just the big boogeymen. They've been brought to life between the Aliens books and this book. We get to see more about their society. I like that a lot. Darien and Sword World factions. So we get some Darien uh, factions. I liked some of these, the long futurists, people that should plan for the long game, that uh, nobody right now is an existential threat, and we should just kind of ride this war out. We get the solvers who want to solve everything up to and including just destroying the enemy entirely, peacefully outward, which want to expand the Darien way of life, and uh, not necessarily peacefully, despite their name. And then the Sword World factions. And then we get some... Look at neutral and minor factions. The Divine Interstellar Red Sphere, another group I might take a look at later. I really enjoyed the, the section on these guys. The Free Trade League, Vargir groups. And the Vargir are very much part of this. Because the Vargir are so fractured with their internal politics, you tend to think of the Vargir as not really being a player, but they are. They have a couple of different uh, packs, clans, whatever you're going to call them, of Vargir who are significant, and they are part of the Outworld Coalition. And then we get a look at the Aslan Ihate bands. The Aslan are not involved in the Fifth Frontier War as such, but the Ihate bands are seeing opportunities to jump in and uh, grab some land when they can. 
I think we're going to see a bunch of adventures and other source books through this. And I think we're going to have some that involve the Aini Guevara a great deal. And I think we're going to see the Ihate bands also. Movers and Shakers, Personalities of the Fifth Frontier War. I was excited to read this section. I have always wanted a, a real meaty look at these folks. And we get Delphine Doriana Mudashir, 15th Duchess of Moria, of Mora, Mora, sorry, Mora, not Moria, that'd be cool. Then we get a look at Duke Norris, the Duke of Regina. I like Duke Norris. Duke Norris plays a lot of important parts in the post-New Era stuff by Martin Doherty that was published in the 90s, early 2000s. There's some really good stuff there. And then we get a bunch more. We get stats on these. I've been the one grumbling about stats. I want stats. Darn it, here we have stats for Duke Norris. I was never asking for a whole big block of stats a la D&D. &D. I wanted just some base stats, and here we have them. I like that Mongoose is doing this in their books. This is something that goes back to how things used to be that I think needed to happen again. So, Lucky Hassan, this is an interesting character. He's just your ne'er-do-well kind of guy whose real first name is Lucky, according to his dossier, but really, he works for the Zodani. So, <laughs> no spoilers there. It's right there in the first paragraph, but it's, it's pretty neat. I like that. A lot of good role-playing there with that. we got many more characters. And then we get the progress of the war. Uh, Mongoose has been very careful to tell us that just because we have the stuff from 40 years ago that tells the outcome of the war, that does not mean the war is going to come out that way. They are open to changing dates and times and possibly even the outcome. And a lot of that's going to depend on how the adventures go and things like that. I like that. So here we get just a look at the progress of the war itself with some really neat maps. And this brings me to one of my grumbles. I love the maps. I think they're great in the book. I was hoping for a poster map showing some of the hot spots, the jumping off points for the Zodani attack, and then the Imperium counterattack. I was hoping for a poster map. Just me. Mongoose never said they were doing one. I was just hoping. I also hoped at some point somewhere in here we would get a recruiting poster for the Imperium or a local force or something to kind of give us a flavor of being in a wartime footing. Uh, even a poster map would have, or poster itself uh, like a folded map, but a poster, a recruiting poster, I think would have been really cool. I think that was kind of a whiff. I, I really think that would have been something that really, really added to the package. The precursor phase, this is how things are before and at the beginning of the war. I like that. It's broken down for us. We do get a nice star map so we can track who's going where. The Riverland campaign, a very important part. Riverland is in the Zodani territory, but it, it, the opening moves of, are coming from there into Jewel and some of the other important worlds right there, Efate. So we get to see a lot of that. Regina, or you might say Regina. I say Regina. Imperial reinforcements coming up from the quarter, uh, quarter fleet. Riverland Endgame. Whoops. Stop it. Okay. And we got to look there. And then with the Corridor Strategic Reserve, which I've mentioned a few times, these get a nice look. I enjoyed that. And a lot of this with the maps and such did remind me of the Rebellion era of Mega Traveler, where we got to see the maps and how information spread and who knew what when and how the fleets were moving and stuff like that. And that took me back a little bit, which I did enjoy. Corridor uh, Reserve Fleet. And then little nuggets here of adventures with Imperial reinforcements. How could your characters interact? The Corward Frontier Campaign. Imperial reinforcements, and how your players are going to deal with that. One thing I found when I was running stuff in the Fifth Frontier War back in the 80s was I didn't make every single adventure about the Fifth Frontier War. Some stuff was just stuff that happened that wasn't directly connected to the war. And this book actually makes that point. They, they say, don't make everything completely revolve around just the goings on of the war. Have some other stuff happening in your characters' lives. We get the Lanth Campaign... And this takes us through, I'll show the timeline, but this takes us up to 1109. And the war in canon from the early 80s ended in 1110. We get the flank campaign, the siege of the fate, siege of Regina, the Macine campaign, and again, some beautiful maps. I just was hoping for some kind of poster. 
That's all. The campaign for, and I'm not even going to try to say that. Uh, this is Sword World. Uh, it's the campaign for hostile containment. And we get a nice look at the Sword World's activities and how the Darians respond. Again, adventures around the Sword World's. The minor theaters, I like that. We get a look at some of the minor theaters. They may not be major important things, but maybe there's a depot here, or maybe there's a fleet that's currently laying over in this space. We get a look at some of that. And again, how to adventure in the minor areas. Point of decision. So these are just key moments for the Fifth Frontier War. And here's the timeline. This is very nicely done. I made a point of really looking this over as I read, because honestly, I thumbed ahead a little bit. I wanted to see if there was any or any ships brought out or anything. I found the timeline. So I was flipping back and forth as I read between the timeline and the uh, the stuff on the war. And the other thing I did is I put the Traveler map up on my smart TV. So I had a map right in front of my eyes so I could lift my head and I could look and I could see, oh, okay, that's where this is in relation to this. It's a jump to whatever the situation was. I had it right there. Recommend having the Traveler map open in some wise while you read this. It's helpful. And then tips on running the campaign. You can have paranoia and hate abounding, factionalism and dissent, economic disruption, opportunism, motivating and involving travelers. How are they involved? They're too small to affect the overall war, or are they? Are they in the right place at the right time? One thing I've always avoided doing with players, and, and is recommended here by Martin Doherty, is you don't put them in the path of a steamroller. You don't have them jump into a system and suddenly be surrounded by a hostile fleet. That's boring. They get taken prisoner, they lose their ship, they break away from the prison, but they, they, they've still lost stuff. It's still something that my players would react very negatively to, and I imagine a lot of players would, so I don't recommend that. And Martin Doherty in here basically says, don't do that. Don't, don't just put them and get them steamrolled. Let their choices have consequences. Balancing consequences, effort, and achievement. Very important, I agree with that. Uh, fleshing out your characters. Here's a nice example of just a trivial character, as Martin calls them. Port site manager reservist. Just a th quick thumbnail. This was something I was grumbling for for Mongoose products, and they've started doing it, and I, I think it's just wonderful. It's just, here we get the Tree Kraken Aberdeen, a local guide. And then we get some tips on running the campaign. This would be NPC reactions to you based on the affinity or enmity table, based on your effect. That can be very useful. Power and influence. Narrative event resolution. So basically, rather than have your players be passive observers to history, to quote Roy Hess from Dinosaurs, you want to have them be a little bit more invo evo involved in the things. But maybe they're just coming into a port and they're getting a news dump, and the news dump has to do with some of the battles, and this is just a good way for you to do it. You can do it as a narrative resolution. You can do it where they're impacted by the narrative revolution you can uh resolution you can do uh their ship gets damaged in some way because they were near a battle just as kind of a narrative thing not rolling dice i like this a lot you can have inconveniences minor setbacks major setbacks severe setbacks partial success minor success major success spectacular success all this can be part of your game you can just have players you accidentally come across a uh, derelict Zodani vessel that has all its missiles aboard. And they, for the effort of moving the missiles from that ship to their ship, end up with a hold full of Zodani missiles. Maybe they can sell them to the Imperium. The Imperium can uh, reverse engineer some stuff the Zodani have been using. Who knows? Narrative task resolution. You can actually have your narrative come out in a way you want your story to come out, or maybe the players will change it. I, one thing I've always found is whatever I plot out a story and I write my outline and everything, 99% of the time, the players are going to change my story. Not just with different ideas, they're going to actually change the story. This gives you some ways to deal with that, and I like that. And then some final notes from the author, and of course a beautiful index, because I love a good index, and then the back cover. All in all, I think Mongoose hit it out of the park with this. This is a book I've been very excited about and is not disappointed. Uh, I said I had a few grumbles. One is I wanted to see some kind of recruiting poster. I wanted to see something along those lines that adds a, a little bit of uh, immersion slash whimsy, in my opinion. I think it's a good thing to, to have in a book like this. 
I also I wanted some kind of poster or some kind of map showing the action rather than just being in the content of the book itself. I get why they did it that way. I was looking for a map. The other thing is there's a fair few typos, which I was surprised about. Mongoose has really been cleaning those up, but uh, I encountered more than a few. Not enough to, to break my love of the book or change my immersion or anything. I was just kind of surprised there were some in there. But as they say, if that's the worst thing I have to say about it, it's been a good day. So Fifth Frontier War, excited to have it in my library. It was everything I hoped it would be. Uh, I'm looking forward to future installments of this. I am not one cringing from this campaign. I've been excited about this campaign. I loved Fifth Frontier War when I came into Traveler. It's one of the earliest things I dealt with in Traveler. And I'm looking for a, a larger fleshing out and a more modern take on it. The original Fifth Frontier War was just kind of something that happened around us and maybe you'd stumble into something. This one feels like it's going to be more dynamic, especially if you decide to run an active duty campaign. This could be a lot of fun. I have been part of an active duty, active duty campaign in the Fifth Frontier War. Uh, my original Traveler GM ran that in the early 80s, and it was a ton of fun. We were the command crew of a starship that was fighting the Zodani. So there you have it. That's my look at the Fifth Frontier War. Let me know what you thought. Uh, maybe I'm, I'm wrong. Maybe this book is not quite what it should have been, or maybe you're just not going to run the Fifth Frontier War, and I get that. A lot of people aren't going to. I am. I'm excited about it, and uh, I like where they're headed with this, and I also like what this foretells a little bit for the Rebellion era, because it's telling me, at least, that Mongoose is not going to be bound into what happened before, and that they're going to be willing to change some stuff. So maybe we won't see the Rebellion era ending in Virus. Who knows, but that's many, many years down the road, and I hope I'm around to see it. But for today, The Fifth Frontier War, a success, a very nice lead-off book, and I'm excited for the rest to come. That's all I've got to say today on page 121. Thanks for watching. If you like what you heard and saw, please like and subscribe. Tell your friends, take a look at my Patreon, help me out there if you can so I can keep getting stuff like this to present. And uh, I'll see you next time on page 121.